Hi everybody. Uh, we're going to work our way through, and you can see the title up on the top of the screen for today, Factor Theorem. And this is going to fall into like a Factor Theorem Part 1. We're going to deal with this kind of in two parts. In terms of importance for today, I mentioned to you guys that Remainder Theorem was probably, or like top three, if not the most important piece of theory. Today is going to be an extension of that, and as we look back over the course of our, our term, our time, we're going to feel like factor theorem is one of the biggest things that we dealt with, okay? I really need us to understand that what we're talking about is an extension of remainder theorem, but we're going to probably lump it in under this title of factor theorem. So to address that today, what I want to do is I want to look back to a problem that we had way back when we were dividing polynomials. So not last time, but the previous time before that. I left an example at the end of that lesson that basically said, show that x minus 5 is a factor of x cubed minus 2x squared, and then fully factor it. And so what you see in the top right corner there, just as I highlight that, what you see is your solution. Now, that's not the way your solution is going to look when you finished off that problem, but given the original expression in white, we should have got down to that factored expression in blue. And really what that example was, what that problem was, was kind of a setup for us as to where we go. So what you'll see in green, then, is really where I want to go for our next short time together. What if I didn't give you x minus 5 as a factor? Could we still have gotten down to the factored form of that expression? So the first thing I want you to recognize is that cubic for us, in the past, the only way we could have factored that cubic was to try to factor it by grouping. And hopefully pretty quickly we can see it does not factor by grouping because if I tried to pull out a common factor from the first two terms and the last two terms, it will not leave me with a common factor. But we can clearly see in what's highlighted in red, it does factor. So we need to have the ability to be able to factor cubics using another method other than grouping. So I want to come back to that green question again. What if you were not given x minus 5 as a factor? Then we need to look at a way for us to be able to factor that expression. So that's where we're going to go for today. That we want to take that problem, focus in on the green, and say, could I factor that original cubic without being given an, a one factor to get it started. Okay, let's jump into our material for today. All I want us to do is to kind of come back for a little reminder. So in your notes, I would be getting down that little reminder you see in blue. And that's not a statement of remainder theorem. Like, we're all good with what remainder theorem is. We should be. That really, the question I want to ask isn't really a remainder theorem question. But rather, what is the remainder when we divide by a factor? We should all be good that it's zero. So if we can put our answer to that blue question together with remainder theorem, then we should be good to start working through the green again. Remember, the green said, what if you weren't given the first factor? So if you look at the green on the screen now, if we were able to have just one factor, then we have the ability to finish off the problem. If you have one factor, then you can do long division to get what the quotient is, and then you can look to factor that quotient further. So our whole goal for today becomes, can we just find one factor? That's what we're on the hunt for. So in order to do that, I want to take a step back. What you'll see on the screen now, you have two problems that I'd like you to work through. Notice what the instruction says. It just says expand and simplify. So I want you to go very quickly through expanding both of those expressions. Simplify everything out. Collect like terms. 
We'll use this as a little bit of a quick gauge as to can we expand some brackets quickly. So let's pause the video as fast as possible. You finish off those two problems. No, okay, we're back. So we, sh oops, not a highlighter. So we should be pretty quick to expand the first. And my guess is since we take a look at those binomials, there's no special patterning with them, that maybe we just went in order and put the blinders on. And now we spend some time expanding the last. I'm going to take three terms times two terms. That's going to give me six terms. But maybe we can go straight to a simplified form. And we can say that I'm going to have an x cubed. I'm then going to have negative 9x squareds and another 6x squareds. So that's going to give me negative 3x squareds. I'm then going to have a negative 40, uh, sorry, 54x plus 5x, so that is going to get me a negative 49x, and then when I expand my constants at the end, there's my minus 45. So hopefully we got down to those same things as we went. Okay, why did I ask you guys to do that? Because now what I want you to imagine is that we're going to go backwards. That I want you to imagine that instead, I've given you the starred expressions, those expressions in blue. I'm actually going to erase this middle expression just so we don't get confused by it. And I want you to imagine that given the blue, could you go back and see potentially where those factors came from? So what you want to do is you want to look at the blue and try to see, could you predict the factors that gave you x squared minus x minus 6? If, given in B, x cubed minus 3x squared minus 49x minus 45, could you see a pattern in the factors that gave us that? We want to try to work backwards to the points where I could actually not even show you and we may be able to predict where they came from. Okay. I know that taking a look at this, you might be a little confused as to actually what I'm asking you to do, or definitely a little bit confused on the, with 100% certainty, can I see? No. But there probably is a level where we could narrow down possibilities for us in terms of factors. Like, could we see some possibilities that given a simplified expression, the factors that would give us that? I want to come back and I want to take a look at A because I think A is very important for us. That when you go to factor that blue expression, my guess is most of us, through practice over the years, would ask ourselves two numbers that multiply to give negative 6 and add to give negative 1. Like, that's our algorithm for being able to factor a simple trinomial. In fact, I'm going to argue that for a lot of people, you don't even look at the negative. That's something that you take into account later on. That you might just say, okay, two numbers multiply to give six, add to give negative one. Like, in fact, you might even ignore the negative one and just say two numbers multiply to give six and add to give one, and then you sort out the signs later. So if we notice that in that trinomial, our focus was actually the constant at the end. That's what started the whole process off. Well, I want you to take a look at the cubic. Yes, it's uglier. But can you see that that 45, the constant on at the end, must be the product for when we take all of the constants within our factors. Now, because there happens to be three factors, we just maybe have more options. Like it didn't have to be one times five times nine. Like maybe it was three times three times nine. That doesn't give me 45. But how about five? There we go. 
that perhaps that was the option. Like, it could have been 1 times 1 times 45. But at least it narrows down the possibilities. Now, we have at our disposal something a little nicer. If we can look back to A, you had that sum aspect that would allow us to kind of narrow down our 6, which told you 3 and 2 as opposed to 6 and 1. Well, it's a little bit more difficult if we take a look in B. We actually have two terms in the middle that were made up of a sum. So maybe our focus is just the constant. And then we figure some stuff out as we go. I'm hoping that just by taking a look at these two quick examples, one that we have in our background, A, and then one B that we want to put in our background, that we can see that the focus for us should be the constant at the end. So let's get down that theory. Let's work with that theory. I want you in your notes to just get down our takeaway from these two questions. And what we should be taking away is just a little therefore statement. That our factor possibilities, and again, they're just possibilities. We can't nail them down to specific factors. However, they must be factors of the constant. Now, I just want to stop there for a second and take a look back at problem B. Up above, I'm just going to write in red, like, we should be pretty certain for now why x minus 2 was never going to be a factor. If we focus in on the 45 as the constant, it doesn't matter what else we write in here. If it's an integer value, you know, like x plus or minus a number, x plus or minus a number, that once I take my 2 times some number times some number, I'm not going to get a 45 out of that. Because 2 isn't a factor of 45. So I know that all my factor possibilities must be factors of the constant. And so what is our process then? Therefore, we test. And could you please underline that test? Underline it a few times. We don't know for certain, but we test the factors of the constant. There's the key. Can we make sure that we highlight in the idea that it's the factors? We don't just pick random numbers and test. That we narrow it down to specific values that could be options. Okay, there is our theory. It's time for us to kind of nail down that theory a little bit and make sure that we're comfortable moving forward. So the rest of today is going to be nailing down that theory, making sure that we are good to factor expressions then to use this theory, and then also we're going to talk about maybe a little bit of a way to, to make your solutions a little more efficient. So here's where I said let's nail down the theory. This is what factor theorem states. It just states that if d of x divides p of x evenly, there's no remainder, then d of x is a factor. Okay, that is a statement about what it means to be a factor. And if we then tie in what we know about remainder theorem, then you can see your factor theorem statement fully in red. That therefore a polynomial p of x has x minus b as a factor if and only if p of b equals 0. Now, two things. Take a look at the green. That's just the short form for if and only if, iff. You'll see that quite a bit in your future. The second part, let's nail down the red. That a polynomial has a divisor if and only if. And now you'll notice that that really is a statement of remainder theorem in red. That's exactly what we talked about last time. That if I sub a constant into my expression, then I get the value of the remainder as if I would have divided by x minus that value. Like It's wordy, but that is our process. So what makes this not 
quite remainder theorem, but a little more exact in terms of factor theorem. Remember the question I've been asking you to focus in on for the last bit? There it is. When we divide by a factor, what's our remainder? Zero. That's what makes this factor theorem. So really, factor theorem is just a corollary to remainder theorem. It's an extension of that same theory. And if it's an extension of that theory, then we also have the gold at the bottom of the screen. I'm just going to slide that up to make sure everyone can see that clearly. That we also then have that AX minus B is a factor if P of B over A equals zero. Now, in terms of our expectation level in the course, our course assumes that you are good with the red. It also assumes that you are good with the gold. But you're not required to have to go through and use the gold to be able to factor an expression. That's actually outside the scope of our course. I'll talk to that a little bit more as we jump in and actually start factoring some expressions. Okay, but there is our factor theorem. It's really remainder theorem. It's remainder theorem in a certain context. Since we're looking for factors, then we're looking for remainders of zero, so we are looking for values of zero. Okay, let's jump in and go a little farther. further. I want to take a step back for a second and just make sure that we have what we need behind us. Question two says, show that x plus two is a factor of that cubic. And I am hoping that if your instinct is to take that and do long division with it, that I can draw to your attention that we are missing our key theory. Nobody should be feeling that they have to do long division in order to answer that problem. We have remainder theorem at our disposal. And so if I was to sneak in my little equals f of x, then remainder theorem says if I'm going to divide by x plus 2, then I can sub negative 2 in and I will get my remainder as if I did the division. And since I'm looking for a factor, then I know that that has to equal 0. So we should be good to finish off that problem. As you're going through to finish off that problem, I want to draw to your attention the words show that at the beginning. When you see those words, that is another way of saying prove. And any time I ask you guys to prove something, it has to be true. Like that is, I can't ask you to prove something when it wasn't true to begin with. I want you to think back to grade 11 identities. I can't ask you to prove that cos squared x minus sine squared x plus blah, 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 equals blah, blah, blah. And then you guys sit there and go through and try to make left side look like right side. And then the whole time I go, um, they weren't actually equal. Ha, ha. I can't do that. That when you see show that something is the case, you know it's the case. So when I'm now working my way through to find f of negative 2, and say I do this. Okay, negative 2 cubed is negative 8. Negative 2 squared is negative 4 times negative 20 uh, minus 4 minus 8. And I go to put all that stuff together. And let's say I actually calculate it. And I go negative 40. I know I goofed up. Like, I know I goofed up. I'm going to argue to you, I know I goofed up here because there's no way that those blue values come together to give zero. I got a negative, and then I'm subtracting a bunch more. That when I take a look at that, because those words said show, then I know that that equals zero must be true. So I know my answer has to equal zero. I just have to show it does. So as I scan my way back and I go, oh, shoot, negative 2 squared is positive 4. That should have been a positive 20 in between. Yep, everything cancels out and I get to 0. If you were to show me the blue, then you are good. Can I just get everybody to write one more sentence underneath that? 
What you just proved in blue allows you to say, therefore, x minus negative 2 is a factor. And that's actually going to be something that we're going to go through and write hundreds of times. But there we go. We've just shown that x plus 2 is a factor because we were able to sub in negative 2 and get it to equal 0. Perfect. Okay, I want to start to progress a little more now. I want us to actually get in and start factoring. So when you take a look at the screen now, you're going to see a little factoring problem. And I'm going to ask you, don't factor it. Or at least, like, factor it in your head, but don't write it down. Okay, everybody should be able to visualize what the factors of that expression are. I'm going to argue to you, if you can't, we're in trouble. So everybody can picture as your factors. But no one is writing them down. Because what I want to do is I want to walk through this one using remainder theorem or using factor theorem. So I know I'm asking you guys to be in a really weird spot. I know I'm asking you to have no ability to be able to factor a trinomial, but somehow have great understanding of theory to be able to use factor theorem. I understand the contradiction there, but I just want us to follow along. I'm going to tell you what I want you to write down just so we can see how we can apply factor theorem. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sneak in a little f of x so I can use function notation to talk about my solution. Okay, I have no clue how to factor that. However, I know that my factor possibilities have got to be factors of the 12. That constant at the end, the 12, has to be what my factors multiply to. So I start to think about all the factors of 12, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 12. I have a lot of factors. And so what I'll do is I'm going to go through and test those factors. So what I do is I now try maybe 1, because one's a nice easy number to sub in. When I sub that in, I get 1 minus 7 plus 12. And I don't even want you to add those things together. Don't even collect. Because the question we're trying to get to is, does it equal 0? Because that's my remainder when I'm dividing by a factor. And I'm using remainder theorem in red to try to find that factor. So as soon as I go 1 minus 7, and then I go plus 12, I don't even care what number that gets to. I just know it does not equal 0. And so really what that red tells me is, therefore, x minus 1 is not a factor. Okay, so now I try my next factor. And here's where we're going to differ a little bit. Like, some people are going to go to 2. Other people are going to go to negative 1. Yeah, don't forget about all your negatives. Like, negative 1 is a factor of 12. So maybe I then try, like, f of negative 1. Negative 1 squared gives me 1. Negative 7 times negative 1 is a plus. Okay, I just want everybody to stop right on that red. Notice that any time I sub in a negative value for my x, there is no way that that is going to give me 0 because I'll never be able to get values that cancel out because everything's going to be a positive. So that doesn't give me 0, and therefore x plus 1 is not a factor. Okay, and now I think we can skip over a bunch of stuff. Could you see going through the same approach, dealing with 2, and now it comes in on 3? Okay, so I've got f of 3, and now I sub that in. Okay, f of 3 is going to give me 3 squared 
minus 7 times 3 plus 12. Hey, that's an equal 0. Everything canceled out. And therefore, x minus 3 is a factor. Okay, I want you to take a look at what you have up on the screen right now because I want you to understand fully about what you have to show me. I never need to see any attempts that do not yield a positive result. And when I say positive, I mean something we were looking for. So all of these red attempts in here, I never have to see that because they didn't give us a factor. As soon as you find one value that gives you a factor, that's all I have to see. Now, you'll also notice these little red calculations up here. I don't have to see that. If you just wanted to say f of 3, you calculated in your head, equals 0, then just write that down. And make sure that you make your concluding statement of, therefore, x minus 3 is a factor. That's your use of remainder theorem. Okay, we have that. And that's the whole thing we were looking for. Remember back at the very beginning of today, we wrote down in green, what if I didn't give you x minus 5 as a factor? What if I didn't give you the first factor? Well, we just got our first factor. We're great. Now, I want you to imagine how long the solution could be. Now you would end up going, okay, therefore, x minus 3. Remember, we would have to do long division for this. Yikes. So now we're working our way through, and your x, x squared minus 3x, negative 4x, negative 4. Well, I just got my confirmation. I have my equal 0 remainder. So yes, I did just confirm that x minus 3 was a factor. And I could then write, therefore... It was x minus 3, and now I see my quotient times x minus 4. Okay, there we go. That's us using factor theorem. Now, clearly, if I was ever to give you a as part of a problem and you had to factor it, if you're doing the blue, you better bet that I'm going to write across your page. Why? Look at all the work. So if you see x squared minus 7x plus 12, can you please just factor it into x minus 3 times x minus 4? However, I'm hoping that this example can show you guys how we can use factor theorem to get the first factor and then what we can do to fully factor. Okay, we're going to jump into a next problem and one that we don't have the sort of background that we have. So let's take a look at the next one. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to go through and we want to factor that one. There's our x cubed plus 2x squared plus uh, minus 5x minus 6. Okay. I still want to walk through this one together, but we're going to do them in its bits. So we're going to do an awful lot of pausing and restarting as we work our way through. Okay. First thing we need to do, sneak in a little function notation so we can talk about things correctly. Okay. Now that that's called f of 6, I want everybody to go on the hunt to try to find one factor. So everyone's eyes are all focused in on the constant on the end. And we are going to check factors of 6. Okay, you go ahead and find some value you can sub in that gives you 0. Pause the video now. Okay, we're back. So I am not going to make the assumption that we all got to the same thing. What I really don't want you to do is to copy my solution. Don't erase what you had if it was different, unless it was incorrect. We're going to get down to the same thing, and I think it's really important, actually, if we do disagree in how we went. So fight the urge to want to erase what you did just so you can agree with me. Don't. We'll get there. Okay, now I've got a little background where when I take a look at this, I really like subbing in ones. And I like when I can sub in one because calculations with one are pretty easy. 
and maybe a little shortcut that can help you out so it's not just blind subbing in and calculating, is I want you to take a look at all your coefficients. So I'm just going to highlight them right now. We had a 1, a 2, a 5, and a 6. My 1s will probably work a positive or a negative one, if I can get those coefficients to group together into two of the same value. So if I group those, for instance, if I was to take my 1 together with my 6 and my 2 together with my 5, I can make two 7s. And if I can get those 7s to be of opposite signs, then they'll cancel out and get me down to 0. So I take a look at the 6 on at the end. That 6 is negative. And since it's a constant, it is never changing. So that means that I want the 1 at the very beginning to be a negative 1. I get a quick confirmation in the middle that if I replace my x with negative 1, then that 5 is going to change signs, and it will be the same sign as the 2. Beautiful. x equaling negative 1 is going to be a value that gets me to 0. Now, I'm just going to get rid of all that yellow inside there. So for me, I am going to then say f of negative 1 I know that that will give me 0. And I can confirm it by subbing in negative 1 and calculating. Okay, f of negative 1 equals 0, and therefore x plus 1 is a factor. No one is changing their solution if they didn't do that. Keep your solution the same, trust me. Okay, we have x plus 1 as a factor. And now we could go off and do some long division. And you could see taking x plus 1 and dividing it into that cubic. And because if I take a cubic and I divide it by something linear, then I'm going to get a quadratic. And we know how to factor all quadratics that are factorable. I want to show you a way that we can get our other factor without using long division. I need to be very clear, though. Everyone in the class needs to be good with long division. However, the only time I use long division is if the instruction actually says divide. My instruction here is not to divide. It's to factor. And so we have another method that we could use that can get us there. What we're going to do is we're going to compare coefficients. The other way to talk about it is we're going to partially expand. We're going to actually work backwards. Okay, I want you to follow along with me in the blue, and we're going to see this method in practice. So what I could then say is I know that one of my factors is x plus 1. I just don't know what the other factor is. And what we're going to do is we're going to work backwards. We're going to partially expand and try to get back to our original. Okay. I take a look, and if I was to expand this, eventually I'm going to take an x times whatever's at the front of that bracket. And I know that that has to get me back to an x cubed. Okay, I can get rid of that box. An x times a what gets me back to x cubed. Well, that's an x squared. And I don't even think you need that arrow in there. That one's pretty logical, like pretty logical. Okay. I want to skip over all the middle stuff in our original expression. Let's skip over the x squared. Let's skip over the 5x. Let's get rid of that. And let's focus in on the constant on the end. Because you know that at some point, you would take this 1 and you would multiply it by that constant at the end, and you know that that has to get you back to a negative 6. Okay, I can get rid of that and the arrow, 
And we would say, well, positive 1 times what gets me negative 6? Negative 6. So at least I filled in two of the missing terms in that second factor. Okay. My suggestion to you is we're now going to expand a little further. And when we do, I want you to draw this arrow on. This arrow is so helpful for people that it's almost to the point where those people who draw on the arrow very rarely make mistakes with it. And those people who think they're above it or want to skip by it too fast, that's where they make their mistake. Okay, take a look at my blue factored form. And I hope that we can see that at some point, you're going to multiply the 1 times the x squared. Well, if I was to expand those blue brackets right now, I can see that I have 1x squared. The issue is, back up in my original, my original has 2x squareds. So that means I need to figure out how to put in more x squareds. My brackets right now give me 1x squared. I need 2x squareds, so I'm going to put in another x squared. Now, I know that when you see me write down just an x, that's going to confuse you a little bit. But I'm going to put on one more arrow. Can you see how when I multiply the x times that x, when I fully expand, how it becomes an x squared. So notice if I expand just those two arrows in my brackets, then there's my plus 2x squared. Now, I do have a little confirmation, so I can confirm that I am correct by just expanding a little more. This 1 times an x gives me a positive x. This x times a negative 6 gives me a negative 6x. And if I collect the two gold terms, then I get confirmation that there's my minus 5x. So notice, I just went through and I factored that expression using factor theorem, but I wasn't stuck having to use long division. Okay, I'm going to just delete a bunch of those arrows because the only arrow that I am asking you guys or strongly recommending would be maybe the way that I would word this right now is for you to put in the red arrow. I think if you just jot down that red arrow, then I think that's enough. That that gets you kind of thinking about partially expanding and that begins the whole process. Okay, now that you have that trinomial as your second factor, you take a peek. It factors further. Two numbers to multiply to give 6, add to give 1, are 3 and 2. I've got the correct signs, and I'm good. Okay, I want you to take a peek at that, and that is one approach to go through. But I also want us to just take a look at our final expression, and maybe you can see your factor in there. Like, I'm going to bet and say that I would have a bunch of people that did not use negative 1 at the very beginning. And maybe when they started off, they said, sorry, that if they subbed in 2, they got 0. And therefore, x minus 2 is a factor. Okay, this is why I told you, don't erase your work. Because that's correct. We're just going to get there a different way. Well, I would also have some people, though, and I hope not too many, but I might have had somebody who got up to subbing in negative 3 and getting 0 and writing, therefore, x plus 3 is a factor. I think that's a little unusual because I have no idea why you would skip over both your 1s and both your 2s, positive or negative, and jump all the way to negative 3. But, hey, the way you see things. We can see the green and the gold in your last two factors. Okay, what I want to do now is I want to go through and I want to compare coefficients on the other two. Just so we can see a little more practice at us comparing coefficients. 
Okay, I want everybody to work through with me on the green. So we could then say, therefore, one of our factors is x minus 2, and now we have the other big ugly factor. Okay, we could start to fill in the first term and the last term. x times what gets me back to x uh, cubed? That's an x squared. We skip over all the stuff in the middle, and we jump to the last term, the constant. Negative 2 times what gets you negative 6? A positive 3. Okay, now we need to partially expand. If I expanded the brackets as written, I'm going to have a negative 2x squared. Look up in the original. In that boxed in green, I need a positive 2x squared. So negative 2 plus what gets me positive 2? I need to add in a positive 4. And now that we have that, we can finish it off. Just factor the trinomial. It is factorable into x plus 3 times x plus 1. Nice. Notice you get to the same spot, the exact same number of steps. Okay, let's work on the gold. So therefore, x plus 3 times something. Okay, that something has to start off with an x squared and if I have a plus 3 as one of my constants, plus 3 times what gets me negative 6? Negative 2. Now I draw on my little arrow to say I'm partially expanding. Right now, I would have a positive 3x squared. Back in my original, I need a positive 2x squared. That means I need to subtract off an x. And now I take a look at that trinomial. It factors, and so that's an x minus 2 times an x plus 1. So I'm really hoping that you guys like comparing coefficients as a means to factor. It works when it factors, but please make sure that we're not trying to, to use comparing coefficients as factor theorem. No. Please also don't think, hey, I can compare coefficients instead of divide. You can only do that if it's a factor, because it goes in evenly. But that gives us our approach. So if I was to give you problem B, then I would expect to see the blue solution or the green solution or the gold solution, obviously not all three. Okay, let's get a little more practice with this. I think we're ready to try some of these problems on our own. Okay, so what you see on the screen now there are two problems that I would like you to go through and factor. Okay, we should be pretty comfortable with the process. If you need to, rewind back, take a peek at problem B. But I want you to try these two problems on your own. Okay, so pause the video now. And then we'll come back and we'll check our solutions. Okay, pause it. Okay, and we're back. So, if I was to go through and deal with C, then I'm going to sneak in a little equals f of x. If I want to try my 1s, then I take a look at that and I notice that my 1, 3, 13, 15, I can pair those up and get 16s. And if I sub in a negative 1, then I'm going to get that to equal 0. That's pretty messy, I'll be honest with you. That's better. And therefore, x plus 1 is a factor. And again, we learned as we went through on b, don't worry if that wasn't your factor. We'll match up in the end. Okay, so therefore, I know one of my factors is x plus 1, and now I'm going to compare coefficients to get my other factor. x times what gets me back up to x cubed? That's an x squared. 1 times what gets me up to negative 15? A negative 15. And now I'm going to partially expand. So my blue brackets right now would give me a 1x squared. I need 3x squareds, so I better add in another two of them. And as we stated earlier, don't worry, that's how they become x squareds. So I take a peek at that next factor, and yes, it does factor. 
Two numbers multiply to give negative 15 and add to give 2 are an x plus 5 and an x minus 3. And there we go. Uh, some people may have gone through and they subbed in 3 and got an equal 0. I tell you, I'd be giving you a pretty weird look right now if you got to negative 5 and subbed that in before trying negative 1 or 3. But, yeah, hey, it works. And as I said, whatever you see. Okay, for anybody who feels a little more confident now that they saw a solution to C, but you didn't get through D, then I'm going to say pause the video again. Go through and get a solution to D. Okay, we had a chance to maybe try D again. I just think some of you guys are going to probably roll your eyes at me a little bit when I put up my solution to this. And as I'm writing this out, some people are like, oh, it factors by grouping. And I'm like, yes, it does. Now, why do I throw in a problem like this? It's because I just want you to notice that we've only used factor theorem on three problems up to this point. And within three problems, I was able to get you to completely forget about your background skills. And so if you went through and started to try to use factor theorem on D, like clearly you can, my bet would be it took us a while for us to get up to x minus 3. But I want to draw your attention to a couple things. First off, if you tried f of 1, I'm thinking we didn't really have our, our blinders off. Because you start to look and go 2 plus 5 minus a big number minus even more. Yikes, those things aren't going to cancel out. And if we were to then say f of negative 1, well, I might say that that was closer, but still not going to get us there. This would be my concern. If you then tried f of 2, If you tried f of 2, you're telling me you don't understand factor theorem. That you are just randomly picking numbers and guessing and subbing them in. Remember what we talked about for factor theorem. We are testing factors of the constant. I can tell right off the bat that there's no way 2 gives me 0 because it's not a factor of 45. And so... If we skipped over 2 and negative 2 because we were like, no, no, I was looking at that, then that's no problem. But it might have taken you a while before you eventually got to f of 3 equals 0, and therefore x minus 3 is a factor. Maybe we got to negative 3. Okay, I just need to underline up here. If you somehow got to like f of negative 5 halves gives you 0... Like, if there was some part where you looked back up at the original and went, yeah, yeah, I think negative 5 halves is going to work, then you got to explain to me what you're seeing. So the first thing on that matter, then, is don't forget that factoring by grouping is still probably faster. I'm going to talk about identifying factoring by grouping again. The second thing, though, in purple is what I spoke about at the very beginning, and I said that I was going to clarify that a little bit. For the limits of our course, the only types of values that you will ever be required to test will be integers in order to factor. That I can't give you a cubic where it would require you to sub in a fraction in order to get the first factor. There will always be an integer value that you will be able to sub in. Okay, hopefully that clarifies that part. But now I want to go back up to the original again. Now, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to erase that minus 45 on the end just because I want to get rid of the outline. So I'm just going to slide that minus 45 back in, but not in purple. 
There we go. Because I don't want us to forget about what we talked during our factoring review. Take a quick peek and focus in on your coefficients. Notice positive 5 divided by 2 gives me 5 halves. And if I then took negative 45 divided by negative 18, well, that's going to give me a positive value. And if I divide a 9 out of top and bottom, I get the same ratio. That that's telling me then that that's going to factor by grouping. And so for some of us, just taking a quick peek at the very beginning, that might give us enough to be able to work our way through the green and be faster than having to use factor theorem. However, for some of us, we're going to get so fast at using factor theorem that you may have been faster going through and getting all the way up to subbing in three to get a zero to then find your first factor and then compare coefficients. So no judgment in terms of approach. I might say judgment if negative five halves was the value that you tried. But otherwise, I think we're good using either method. Okay, let's jump in and tackle one more. Okay, that one's going to look a little different to you, but there's no tricks involved. I'd like you to go through and factor x cubed minus 27, and we'll use that one as our gauge. Okay, so I want everybody to pause the video now, factor that expression. Now, okay, and we're back. So if I sneak in my little f of x, I'm actually hoping that this one was very direct. Like, we should have been fine. Nobody was trying ones, because even though it's a factor, come on, 1 minus 27, not even close to 0. We skipped over 2s, because 2s aren't factors of 27. And so to jump into 3 and get that to equal 0 was probably pretty quick. And therefore, x minus 3 is a factor. I need to see the blue. Well, now I have a therefore, because there's no operation that takes me to my next line. But I can say that my expression looks something like that. Now I compare coefficients. I need an x squared at the front of the bracket. I need a positive 9 at the end of the bracket. And now when I partially expand, I have negative 3x squareds there. I need no x squareds. My middle terms cancel out. So if my brackets give me negative 3x squared, then I need a positive 3x squared in there to get everything to cancel out. The only hiccup might have been that we made the assumption that that other trinomial must factor. No, there's no two numbers that multiply to give 9 add to give 3. My expression is fully factored in what you see in blue. So there you guys go. Today was Factor Theorem 1. Okay, if you need to, flip back, watch any sort of portion of this uh, lesson. Biggest part that I want us to take away. Seriously, it's that important. Everybody that I see who draws the arrow doesn't necessarily factor by comparing coefficients perfectly. They normally do pretty well, but I can't promise perfect. However, most of the time when somebody struggles to compare coefficients and I ask to see their work, they didn't put on the arrow. So I think you're hurting yourself by avoiding drawing on that little red arrow. Okay, I think it helps. Your job now, jump in and get some practice factoring using factor theorem. Okay, good luck.